Hey you guys, welcome back to the channel. So today I decided to sit down with uh, the new Surface device that I have and uh, do a really quick uh, inking of one of the drawings, sketches, doodles, whatever you want to call it. I like to sit down and doodle a lot. It is what it is. And I wanted to record the screen and annotate um, and kind of narrate through the inking process and my thoughts and how that goes. I didn't finish the illustration, so even though I sit and, and draw and talk for about 30 minutes, I didn't finish it. But uh, I just wanted to get you guys, um, you know, in the mind of uh, an illustrator slash designer artist of the process that I go through whenever I'm inking slash refining slash sketching and drawing an illustration and the thoughts that I go through, um, you know, within that process. You're going to hear a little bit of, uh, as you probably hear right now, I've been 3D printing. I've got, you know, a whole bunch of 3D projects I've been working on. So if that's irritant, plus I've got sinus issues. So I'm, I, I'm doing the best that I can uh, within, that, within the confines of some of those issues. But I, I just wanted to really get to you guys the importance of process, right? Whenever I used to hire illustrators and artists at the company I used to work for, one of the big things for me was always process book. I wanted to see how you thought. It's important that you don't cookie cutter things. You know, we as artists and illustrators tend to go to habits, right? You use the same kind of pencil, you use the same kind of paper, you, you find what works for you through the process of elimination. And a lot of times that kind of gets us in a box, right? I don't want you to be in a box. Art is creativity, it's freedom, it's examination, it's exploration. And that's one of the things that is really a moniker of not only my career, but also my channel. I want you guys to really explore and find out not only what works for you, but what doesn't work for you and what has the potential to change you as an artist. We we don't want to get mired down into, like I said, being put into a box. Um, one of the really interesting things about my career uh, as I progress through, I get these questions a lot uh, pertaining to how you can mold your style and mold how you do things in such a different way. And that's because, uh, you know, I have that childhood view of the world. I, I've tried not to lose that. It's, it's hard not to lose that. Um, and I want to continually learn and progress and change and do those things that make me a better artist, uh, an illustrator and human and storyteller. So that being said, uh, go ahead and, and just sit down, grab a cup of coffee, watch the video. Um, nothing nothing really deep here just showing an initial sketch that i did you know last night took me about 25 minutes to do the sketch and then sit down another 30 to start refining the pencils and then after that i'll put in color and then i'll put in texture and maybe i'll uh, i'll post that on instagram so anyway thank you guys um and uh stay tuned um for many more videos to come and i'm excited uh this year was supposed to be something completely different but you know how that goes. Work gets in the way and life gets in the way. But I'm still trying. So enjoy the video, you guys. Thanks. This is Beans, my character that I've been working on for quite a while. And he's sitting at a lounge chair, just chilling. And I'm in Sketchbook Pro right now. Um, it's about a 300 by 300 DPI. No, 300 DPI, 9 by 12 layered file in Sketchbook Pro. I like using Sketchbook Pro because it's such an easy program to use. And I can save file, save as. You see there's a myriad of different types of file I can save as. The one being uh, Photoshop, which is probably the most useful. Cancel. And I really like using it because it's at first it's very easy to use. Second of all, because of the, um, the the robustness of the rendering engine, it's got just uh, a great feel to it, and it's really fast, and it's kind of a stripped down. It's no frills. It has a lot of the options a lot of the higher end programs have, and plus, at the time of, of getting this program, it was free. Now it's about twenty dollars on the Microsoft or Apple Store, and it's worth every penny. Um, in addition, you can still buy brushes for it and download brushes for free. It comes with a myriad of brushes. These are the ones that I purchased uh, throughout my years. And I've had this program, gosh, for a very long time. This is 
used to be manufactured by Alias, the same company that made makes Maya. And as you see, all these indicators up here, you've got symmetry, and it not only has vertical symmetry, but horizontal, radial, you can change the number of sectors, you can do all the myriad of different things. It's got a, uh, if you need a straighter line, it's got that, it's got a line correction similar to what Procreate has. Uh, shape, you can go in layers. It's of course got your flood fill, your paint bucket, transform, quick transform, your crop uh, or marquee tool, and selection uh, as well. And it's got an ellipse tool, so if you need to draw a really accurate uh, circle, it's got that. You can go around and you know, do the eyes and stuff like that. So, And of course, this is really cool if you need to do some type of uh, curve. Um, it's got uh, one of these doodads. So that being said, let's get back and you can hide and show. But the interface is really simple to use. I picked it up probably within you know a couple hours. And then of course it's got color corrected Copic libraries from illustration to design markers. And you know, go in and it's got all the markers with the correct codes, which is pretty cool. I really like that. Typically keep him over here. And if you don't want to use the Copics, you can just double click on this icon right here and it's got a color wheel, which is also really cool. Um, and this, these little pucks, these are the interface pucks right here that you can go in. Let's get on the brush setting over here and you slide, you touch it right in the center and you hold and you slide to the right and to the left. You see that's down at the bottom. It gives you the size. And if you go same and you, you, you push up, you can change or down, you can change the opacity of the brush. That also is very handy dandy. So it does the same thing here. Saturation, you know, all the way up to 100% if I drag it to the right. And if I go up and down, the luminance. So it's just, it is a fantastic program, you guys. And if I come over here to the, to the brush palette, I can double click. And it brings up a sub menu, and I can go into the advanced, and I can change a lot of the stroke and pressure curve um, settings on the brush to my liking. And of course, you guys saw all the brushes that are here, and it's just fantastic. It's a wonderful program that I highly recommend to everyone. Even if you got to pay twenty bucks for it, it's still a steal. So let's get to, and this is the the one that I like the most, not the most, but just for my sketching is brush three. This comes in their basic brush sets and I just went in and and uh, modified it slightly here's their traditional set that comes with the program and it comes with a lot of different brushes um, already so and whenever you get it if you go to the sketchbook pro if you just google sketchbook pro you can go in and download a lot of the free brushes so what I'm doing right now is just going in and revising my sketch you see beans is just sitting in a lounge chair chilling Chillin', chillin', and he's got his little remote control. I just wanted this to be something simple. You know, the, a lot of times I'll just sit down and start sketching. I've got my, uh, either, you know, I'll start sketching either on my iPad or I'll, you know, grab um, one of the tablets that I have uh, handy dandy. And this one, of course, being the newest, latest, and greatest sketch, uh, sketch device. It's not really, a, I call it a sketch device, but it, it is a full computer. And that, of course, being the um, the Surface Laptop Studio, and that's what I'm working on right now, and recording the video on uh, as well. I recently did a review of this particular device and found it to be probably the best sketch device computer all-in-one that I've ever tested, and I've owned a lot of them. So if you're interested in understanding why it has such high marks. <laughs> And I'm not the only one to say this, you know, I'm, I, I basically always try and show that I'm not the end all, you know, judge on, on devices. And there have been numerous other illustrators and designers and people in the field indicating that this was, you know, is probably the best, it is the best surface that uh, has ever, in my opinion, has been made um, ever. So that's a big deal because, you know, they've been making, making services for a while. And um, to have one as good as this is, is just 
uh, like I said, it's a great resource. So what I'm doing right now is I'm going back in and I'm just defining um, those areas as far as the sketch goes. This is like tightening the sketch. All right, this is not typically the brush that I use for tightening the sketch. I'm just literally right now I'm trying to iron out some of the characterizations and I like keeping this particular brush handy dandy uh, for that matter. You know, you got the pencil and it's got a nice fine line to it. Let's go ahead and make that larger so you can see. And it's good. It's got nice taper to it. You can go in and, you know, mess around and if you want to. and Make it look all sweet and pretty. And like right here, if I want my line to be a little bit lazy, you see how it pulls? It's like pulling. And I can get a really nice curve if I don't trust my initial stroke. But I don't I don't typically use line smoothers. I like feeling the line. A lot of times line smoothers will actually get rid of some of the nice qualities. Of, uh, of line that you would naturally put down. So I don't typically use line smoothers. <clears throat> um, what else? What else? Oh, let's go back. I'm on the wrong brush. See? See, that's got a nice texture to it. So what you can do is I can reset that completely. See, yes, it's going to ask me a question. So now it goes back to its original setting, which is a little light-handed, right? So right now I've got it a little bit too big. So I need to go ahead and go to advanced, size with heavy pressure, flow with heavy pressure. I need to be darker. Yeah. Okay, let's try and see how that works. Yeah, that works pretty good. So this, this illustration that I'm working on right now, again, is, is a doodle. <laughs> um, if you guys hear a machine in the background, it's because I'm printing today. I'm doing some 3D prints, and you can hear the cracking, which means I think my filament is binding a little bit. Anyway, back to the illustration. So the, why do I do things like this? This is more or less an experiment. I do a lot of experiments in the context of my illustration career. I try things, I try new programs, I experiment um, to see what works, what doesn't work, and you know, then I apply it to my business. Um, but I find it very important as I progress, because I've been doing this a while, even though I've been doing this a while, I still don't rest on quote unquote my laurels, my abilities. You know, we, we as artists and illustrators and designers and creators, we always need to be kind of pushing ourselves a little bit more. Um, especially if you're doing this for a living, you don't, you don't want to be passed up by somebody else that has a, uh, maybe a skill that you don't have, um, handy dandy and suddenly they get the job just because they had that one little simple itty bitty skill. <clears throat> yeah, I can, I can, not that this is a real world situation, but they're like, yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can whittle, I can whittle a pencil, and then both their skills are exactly the same, except they can whittle a pencil, and then suddenly they get the job, and you're like, ah, oh, well, I can learn how to whittle a pencil. Well, no, because that's time, and I think you understand what I'm trying to get at. It's, it's like you're constantly, you want to constantly be improving and doing things that, you know, make you better. Um, excellence is a choice. Right? I always thought it was... In, let's see right here. It's a little bit of... That brush is kind of doing th some weird things. So I'm going to go ahead and reset it again. A lot of times with, uh, with <clears throat> certain brushes, especially inside this program, it will kind of mess with you a little bit. You can mess with the texture, flow, light pressure, roundness, rotation, scaling, percentages, 100%. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, that's pretty good. Let's make it small. Um, 
excellence. Excellence is a choice. You know, I always find it interesting that those people that, you know, complain about uh, equality in the workplace. You know, I want equality. I want, I want the same pay. I want this and that. And I think, you know, there are organizations, a lot of organizations that really prefer one type of worker over another. And most of them prefer a hard worker over a worker that doesn't work very hard. And, you know, maybe you have one worker that has terrible habits and, and they don't have us have a, uh, have a work ethic of excellence. And then they complain and they're like, well, I want, I want to be paid the same as Joe Schmo. And, you know, Joe Schmo has an incredible work ethic. Whoops. And they don't have the same work ethic as Joe Schmo. And then they complain. And that's the one thing that you really have control over is your level of excellence um, as it pertains to what you do. So I recommend, uh, just as a personal development, you kind of level yourself up. You know, we can always have somebody else level us up. Level me up. I want to be better. But uh, the biggest gains happen whenever you do things on your own. You know, and you self-motivate and you self-preservate and you do things that better yourself. And, and suddenly you don't have somebody that, you know, pushes you. Some of us need that push. Some of us need a little bit of, you know, here and there and everywhere. Oops, let's go ahead and do this. Need that little bit of push for somebody and that, that encouragement. And I get that. You know, I, I need that too. And, but I'm going to be honest with you. There's times that even though I had the encouragement, I still didn't, uh, didn't make things happen in my life. And I always wondered, well, what's wrong with me? Do I have a deficiency? Well, not really. It kind of goes down to what was, you know, instilled in you when you were younger and your work ethic and how, you know, certain things happened. And a lot of it is baggage. So I had to get rid of a lot of the baggage of, you know, whenever I was growing up and, uh, so on and so forth. So I already notice right now that he's not really turning out the way I want. Um, I think everything, you know, is looking pretty decent, but I'm starting to notice some things. So this, one of the things that I think is very important, especially whenever I'm doing illustration work and I'm recording it, is to let you understand my thought process um, and how I think whenever I'm doing an illustration. So right now I started out as a doodle, so I didn't take it too seriously. And But as I progress through and I start making things and making changes and decisions, then things can become a little bit more real. <laughs> uh, you know, I, if I'm going to spend the time to do the illustration, I want it to look good. I want it to look right. So what I'm noticing right now is even though I like his head proportion, I think um, some things that are going on, first of all, I think this eyebrow is too high. I think that it needs to be lowered. Second of all, I'm having an issue with this right here. You see how this line comes up and then you have this line kind of mirrors that line. And you're having these lines that are kind of creating a semi-quasi-tangency. And tangency is something that that uh, I don't like in my drawings. So what I have to do is I have to basically erase that line. And now I'm in the experimental stage. So this is obviously, see, that they're on the same level, but unless I have this eyebrow a little bit higher, which I don't want that eyebrow higher. Okay, so that's, see what I'm noticing is the volumes, the volumes aren't working. So I've got this nice big round area over here. I need to go ahead and make this a little bit rounder over here to balance because it's just not right anatomically. And you're like, anatomically? It's a freaking cartoon. Yeah, but a lot of the, a lot of times, um, unless you're doing a really obscure and uh, exaggerated caricature, you have to have things based in reality. So I have to have this look a certain way for it to be believable, even if it is a cartoon. Because then you look at it and go, well, something's not right. And then you don't understand why, but you know. See, again, this whole area right here is kind of throwing me. Yeah 
have that come around here a little bit further out. That's why I'm starting to see that perspective incorrect. There we go. Nope, we need a little bit further. Yep, this is all wrong right up here. And this is the part of the correction that we go through. You know, illustration, illustrators, you know, creators, people that do this for a living. You look at something and, it, and there's a feeling. You know, there's that feeling that it just doesn't, something's going on that's not gelling right. And you have to examine why. A lot of times um, in the art field, you'll have people that don't know how to express why it's not looking right. And they'll say, well, it doesn't look cool enough. Well, it doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. Well, those words are, 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 or it needs to look happy. It needs to look this and that. And, and those are emotion words. Cause a lot of times people describe with their emotions. So, you know, you have to literally be a mind reader in some context and, you know, in some situations. So I think too, this is, Nope. I think I'll leave that. I kind of like that. This needs to go up a little bit further. All right. Let's go do this. Yeah. Yeah, see, it's not. Again, this is part of the process whenever I'm working on something like this as I progress through. I'm changing things. I'm determining what's working, what's not working. I kind of like the way the other one was going. You know, I don't typically do a huge amount of erasing because I kind of see things in my mind's eye pretty clear. That mind's eye is a developmental thing that, that me as an artist has developed over years of practice and muscle memory and a lot of those things. So... Yeah, whenever you look at an artist that can do things really quickly and efficiently and well, they've developed their mind's eye to do that. So, yeah, that's not even down far enough. Yeah. It helps, too, especially in the sketch phase, if you draw through. So, draw drawing through, you hear that in animation. It's called the draw through. You need to understand volume. Volume and form. So... I had a false positive there. Volume and form being, of course, this. This and understanding that as a top, a side, a front, and a back you can't see. So in the draw-through, let me erase this really quick. In the draw-through, especially whenever it comes to character design, you have to understand that he has a front here, he has a top, he has a bottom down here you can't see, he has a side, and he has another side. And a lot of times, to determine where this is, you have to draw through and understand that 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 form continues through behind this particular object, in this case being his nostril, or his ah. nose. So, yeah, learning how to develop your mind's eye and form, and, and you know, we always think, Whenever you're drawing, oh, it feels really good. Why does it feel really good? Well, because the person that drew it understands form, volume, and has developed their mind's eye. So, let's get back to drawing here. As I progress through, so right now I'm kind of, I'm looking at the underlying sketch. I'm going back here. I'm kind of thinking, okay, so this whole, that's a mess. It looks like a mess. So I need to go in and I've got wrinkles and how I'm going to, you know, the weight affects this particular object and form. And you see how I've got this hand right here. It goes in through his shirt and to his elbow right here. That is important. Those are the things that we, as, you know, artists and illustrators, we think about those things. You know, he's he's sitting down. He's He's got his drink. He's got, you know, his, uh, his remote control right here. So... It's bunching up right here, the clothing is. So right now I'm kind of concentrating on, okay, so his shoulder comes up, comes around, so that needs to come in just slightly. And then it bunches up a little bit. 
and how fabric lays and how it bends. That's a whole other that's a whole other tutorial in your brain, you know. If you don't know how to do fabric, then learn how to do fabric. A lot of times it's just understanding how weight and volume and and uh go ahead and do this. Switch. Okay. And volume work and how I'm, I'm, you know, illustrating the fabric, and a lot of times I, I'll look at fabric, and I'll look how, yeah, the brush is doing something weird. You know, I, I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, maybe it's the machine, but I don't think it is. With these new all-in-ones, you have uh, a lot of variables going on, especially whenever it comes to pressure curve. Okay, so a lot of times I gotta adjust the pressure curve just slightly to get what I want. And that's pretty good. So as I continue through, just, you know, little things like over here, maybe I'm gonna put something extra, maybe there's a pin or something I'm gonna put on the, uh, let's go back to black. I'm gonna put on the table, you know, what kind of pin do I want? So this is a very good example of understanding storytelling and how you don't want things to, it, they need to make sense. Every object in the illustration needs to make sense. So I put the paper there again because he's, you know, possibly in his living room. So what else is going to be on the table? He's holding his drink. Whoops. He's holding his drink. And, you know, maybe a pen, you know, do a pen here. Or pencil. There we go. And I don't want it going the same direction as this because, again, I don't want that repetition. And there has to be scale relationship between the pen and the paper. You can't have this gigantic pen. Yeah. And paper's kind of folded over a little bit. Again, gravity affecting it. Not just having a, a blank. You know, even having a blank piece of paper. This Right now it's blank, so I haven't put anything on there. So I'm going to wait to determine if I'm going to put anything on. So then I move on to his hand. So you, keep me, you see me keep zooming in and out. And that's important because, again, I need to have... I need to have... Uh, Size relationship. So even though I've sketched in his hand, we're still in that quasi-sketch phase. So I'm going to go ahead and change the... Make this a little bit darker. Flow with heavy pressure. I'm just going to make it dark. Yeah. All right. So now I'm still in that sketch phase. So I'm going to go ahead and have his... Good. So I need to think, okay, so here's, maybe his hand goes out like this. So I need to have this come up a little bit further. Here. And then here's the front of the remote. And then it's got this bulbous area where the infrared antenna comes up. Here. All right. Maybe I got a few buttons in there that I'll show here in just a minute. But what I'm trying to do now is to kind of show you, give you that roadmap. I talk about that roadmap a lot. Kind of here, here. Yeah, it needs to come around. That illustration roadmap and continually refining. Whoops what I'm trying to do here, and this kind of curves down a little bit. Yeah. Not the final line. That's important for me to iterate to you guys. Right now, we're still in that sketch phase, still in that experimental stage, still having fun, not going in and painting by numbers, still changing things, right? 
I had kind of struggled. Yeah, see, that's a tangency right there when you have the edge of that. This is the edge of his little moo moo. Okay. Comes out. All right. Kind of comes around. Let's do this. He has calf muscle. There we go. And then it comes down. And then it's folded under. Remember, he's in the moo moo. It's not laying on top of him like a blankie. So you have to show that other part right there and his leg coming out of it. Yeah, so right now, you think of sculpting. I always think of sculpting whenever I draw. I think, okay, I'm sculpting the drawing in a way that makes <clears throat> sense in the context of form. So I'm thinking roundness here, roundness here, and then it comes out towards me, and you've got this dip right here. You know, the folding fabric that's that's being formed. And you've got his leg, and you've got the the chair that's being indented by his leg. So constantly thinking, constantly refining. And you know, I, I'd actually sat. I, I thought for a minute. You know, I really need to put slippers on him. So I think I'm going to do that. So let's do that really quick. Okay, give you erase that. Now it's important that I understand what's inside the slipper, right? You got to understand what's inside the slipper. So it's always good to at least draw what's in there. But if you want to keep things really, you know, simple. Hold on here. Okay. Whoops. Whoa. Let's do this. A lot of times I do have the brush size set on my uh, scroll wheel on my device. A lot of times it's better if you just don't use that. So you see how this has a bottom, right? So let's go ahead and do this. This is what I see right here. I'm not thinking in terms of all these details. This is how I'm thinking right now. Okay? So I have to think that way. Right? So I've got this big slipper that comes around. Maybe it's... Like that. Typically slippers are oversized, so I need to make sure and cover his tootses. Good. So what kind of slipper? So I, I like bears, so let's give him a... And his best friend's a bear. He likes bears a lot, just like me, even though they're death machines. Gigantic 12-foot, 1,000-pound death machines. I've been watching a program on uh, Disney Plus called Something Bit Me, and there have been some interesting ones. I mean, one, of course, being a snake. Okay, a snake bit me. Okay, rattlesnake. I'm, I don't know why I got bit. I'm out, I'm out in the woods wearing sandals. Blah, blah, blah. I, I just don't get it. It's because you're wearing sandals, you moron. You need to be wearing boots. Leather boots. You you know, lessen the possibility of getting bit. But one of the ones that really surprised the crap out of me was, of course, a woman got mauled by a freaking polar bear. And it was horrendous, guys. She, uh, she wouldn't do anything wrong. Walked out with friends. She had friends, and the polar bear came right at her. Picked her up by her head, shook her like a dog, ripped the back of her scalp off, and I'm like, ah! This is, of course, I'm watching this before I go to sleep. That was horrendous. Anyway, I love bears, and, you know, I, I say that they're death machines because they are. It's, it's like, yeah, I was out in the wilderness, wilderness by myself. Okay, number one, not good. And, yeah, I, I stumbled up on a kill, and it was moving, and I thought, wow, what, wait a minute, oh, no. It's a mama with her cubs <laughs> i'm like well you're dead yeah it's a, it there's a video on youtube of this lovely teacher she's a riot and she's southern i believe she's southern and she's like you know i don't have any problems let me look at this see i'm talking to you and i'm messing things up I'm messing them up i don't have any problems with animals per se but 
when when you go into a shark's house, they have the right to eat you. You go into the oceans, they have a right to eat you. And I'm like thinking, well, yeah, she's that's logic. <laughs> she dropped a logic bomb on me. So, anyway, I digress. I go back. So you can see, this is literally, and this this foot's too small. So what I can do. It's been a while since I've used this. Okay, so let's do this lasso. Let's try it. Whoop. Then we go here. No. So let's do lasso. There we go. much better okay so basically what I did was I used the lasso tool right here I clipped cut it and then it brought up the sub tool and you can make it bigger you can make it smaller you can move it around so on and so forth and you click the uh, item again and it turns it off yeah so that's what I'm gonna do so I just wanted to show you guys Sort of a quick overview of my inking process. Very simple. I don't go in and, and you know, draw a bunch of hatch lines like this. And But right now I'm still in the early, uh, the, uh, the early stages of this illustration. I probably have two more generations of ink changes on him just because... There's so much going on, you know, and I'm trying to fix the anatomy and get things halfway presentable. You know, I might, I might go through three generations. So that's wrong. Let's go ahead and do this. Three generations of inking. Uh, change. It's not really inking per se. Um, it's I'm sketching. I'm sketch revising. You know, it's important. Those are the important things. You have a good sketch. It's a good sketch, and then it's gonna be good. You know. I remember the. Whenever I, I used to restore cars and stuff, one of the things that uh, was always iterated to me is preparation is ninety five percent of the paint job. <laughs> And I was always like, screw that, give me the paint, the paint will cover everything, look. Well, it does to an extent, but the problem is, is if you want something to look really good, and that has to do with that excellence quotient I came back to earlier, or I, I, I talked about earlier, that excellent quotient, excellence, you know, it is 95% of the paint job, because if you paint over a flaw, you're still going to be able to see the flaw, and it'll it'll be something that'll detract from the entire paint job, you know? I can't tell you how many times I've looked at paint and everything looks really good except for this one thing and you're like, oh, okay. It's like if you were to drink a big old glass of chocolate milk and you're like, wow, this chocolate milk's great. But something small, something tiny, almost imperceivable, it just doesn't taste right. What is that? And, you know... You find out that it has poop in it. I mean, that's that's horrendous. Huh. I mean, you're like, but it's 95% good chocolate milk. But it's only 1% poop. Well, you wouldn't drink it because of that 1%. So the same thing applies with the illustration work. Preparation and doing things with excellence is going to get you where you want to go. And I'm not saying perfect. Don't, don't, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Perfection is not, you know, obviously, I, I don't do things in a perfect way. <laughs> but, there is that excellent quotient, and, you know, be your own worst critic. Or be your own most severe critic, not worst. So, and that's what I'm doing right now. Just going in and fixing things and making things fun. He looks happy. He's just chilling, having a glass of milk. You know, 
All right, you guys, thanks for visiting. And maybe I'll put this on time lapse um, and post it. Uh, definitely enjoy the videos. More to come. You know, as a design, I, 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 I used to love to design furniture. And sometimes I get a little carried away. So I'm like, yeah, this will be cool. But even putting little things like this, and then I'll go down here, and maybe I'll have a line. Maybe there's a seam right there, and you'll have one, two, whoops, one, two, three. And how that adds, just that simple detail adds to, to the overall presence of the illustration and makes it more believable, even though it's cartoony. I don't know if that's even a word, cartoony. Anyway, I hope you guys liked the video today. Please like and subscribe if you like what you see. And I know this isn't a finished illustration, but this wasn't supposed to be. First, it was supposed to be a test, but also it's supposed to show you that there is a process and a thought process that goes behind these illustrations. You know, you see all these wonderful illustrations and time lapses, and you're like, dude, you can draw so well. You're so talented. Oh, my gosh. You know, talent's one of those two-edged swords because... It blankets a lot of things that we don't see, which is massive amounts of hard work, practice, and sacrifice. So talent is one thing, natural talent, but also, you know, I always like to make comments, man, you really worked hard on that, didn't you? A lot of a lot of late nights and hard working on that, you know, because talent, talent is a very small portion of the equation whenever it comes to stuff like this, you know? Maybe you don't. Whoop. All right, you guys. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Okay. See him in his all of his glory. His glory. All right, guys. See you soon. Bye.